all good things to those who wait. Hi, I'm Sari Sudekran. In this video, I wanted to explore the filmmaking and cinematography techniques of The Silence of the Lambs. This is a new series that goes in depth into the filmmaking process. If you find these kind of in-depth videos useful, please let me know in the comments below. Any feedback would be welcome. The Silence of the Lambs is an iconic horror film. It's one of the very few horror films that have won an Oscar. In fact, it won the top five Oscar categories, best director, best actor, best actress, best screenplay, and best film. For those of you who haven't watched the film, it's about an FBI trainee played by Jodie Foster and a cannibalistic psychiatrist played by Anthony Hopkins as they hunt for a serial killer called Buffalo Bill. In this video, we're going to look at the first four scenes of the film because I find those scenes to be the most powerful. If these first four scenes didn't work, the rest of the film would have just fallen flat. You have to establish the main characters and you have to establish their connection and you have to sell the proposition that they can be connected in this weirdly odd way. And every aspect of filmmaking, from acting to cinematography to colors and costume design, they all add up to selling the effect. A lot of focus is on the performances in uh, The Silence of the Lambs, but it also has meticulous cinematography. Tak Fujimoto was the director of photography for the film. The first four scenes of the film introduce Clarice. The first scene is of her in a training ground. She is called by her superior because she has to meet her boss. The second scene, she meets her teacher at his office. He gives her a job, an errand, he calls it, not exactly a job. In the third scene, she meets a doctor who controls her access to Hannibal Lecter. And in the fourth scene, she meets Hannibal Lecter. Let's start from the most important challenge that the director would have faced, which is to establish the main character, Clarice Starling, played by Jodie Foster. The very first title over we get is The Woods Over Quantico. Anybody who's been watching FBI films knows where Quantico is. So it's pretty obvious that this might be a location that the FBI controls. So it's an early morning, the atmosphere is dreary, it's foggy, probably very cold. Reminds me a lot of how Seven begins as well. Seven has a very similar mood to The Silence of the Lambs. And then you see this lone figure, Jodie Foster, pulling herself up. She's not being followed by anybody because uh, she does not show any sign of concern uh, or fear. She's completely comfortable. She's running at a constant cadence. And the shots are just generic, right? They follow from behind, they're from the side, close-ups. And then you see the second obstacle that she comes across as she tries to climb her way over it. Basically like a guinea pig, you know, in an obstacle course. And then of course somebody calls her because Crawford wants to see her at his office. And she replies with, Thank you, sir. Which also goes to show that she is probably a recruit and she isn't a full-time officer yet. But that's the impression that I get. He's the first male that she comes across in this film. He wears a baseball cap and a hoodie, but he's probably not very happy about doing that job because he doesn't get himself involved in any banter with uh, Clarice. He doesn't smile, very businesslike. As she goes along, from here on out, every male that she comes across gets worse and worse in terms of what they want to do to her and how they want to dominate over her and show their power over her. Obviously, law enforcement everywhere in the world is male-dominated, and as she runs across a field full of people, it's mostly all male. There's this shot of her walking into an elevator filled with guys and they all look at her. Now, to a male watching this film, and I'm one of them, you have a certain perspective, but I bet a female watching this film would understand these things from a different perspective because every time she steps out of the house, if it's a city, she's being looked at, ogled at, stared at by males every single day. I don't think there would be a day where this is not the case. Males don't get that kind of attention. This film is about what a woman actually goes through under intense scrutiny by males of all sorts. Those with good intentions and those with not so good intentions. You can see everywhere she goes, people are looking at her with different kinds of expressions on their faces. Some of them are serious, some of them smile flirtatiously. Just shows the entire gamut of 
how males interact with females. Now, not every male does this, obviously. But in this film, we feel what she feels and it becomes very intense over the course of the next four scenes. We learn about the subject of the film as she steps into his office. Of course, he keeps her waiting. Again, a subtle nod to the power dynamic that's here. But what really sells the differential in power in this scene is the way he sits across her. He knows her from before, but should there be this sort of familiarity between them or is just him expressing his power, maybe subconsciously? He is doing that, isn't he? That's the impression I get watching him. And then of course he offers her a job. Not a job really, more of an interesting errand. Sit down. He's telling her she's great, but he's putting her in a place nevertheless. It's part of the investigation for sure, but he doesn't want to reveal that at this point in time. But the audience knows, because that's what the film is about, she will eventually get herself embroiled in this investigation and the subsequent capture of Buffalo Bill. Jodie Foster, though, looks at him directly. She doesn't shy away. Uh, she's not uncomfortable in his presence. She's listening, paying attention to everything he says. She probably respects him a lot, you know, like a father figure or a teacher. Maybe he interprets it in another way. So this is the second male that she meets. And obviously he is more powerful than the first person. The first person was ordered to call her. Now she's in the third scene of the film. She meets a person who controls her mission in a way. She cannot meet Hannibal Lecter unless he lets her. He is, of course, a doctor. Again, somebody who outqualifies her but gets worse as a personality. At this point, we don't know what sort of man he is outside his hospital, but you can clearly see that he cannot read the signs. She's not giving him any eye contact. She's not goading him in any way. She's not encouraging him or flirting back in any way, but he keeps pressing. So he's oblivious to her discomfort here. Yet he agrees to show her, take her directly to Hannibal Lecter because he's under the impression that he's going to be in on it. Uh, the interview or whatever talk that they're going to have. And here's the first sign of her not being so weak. It was so very important to establish this fact before she met Hannibal Lecter. Because if she cannot tackle somebody as brash as the doctor, how on earth is she going to tackle Hannibal Lecter? Why would Hannibal Lecter want to respect such a person? Unless he knows for sure that she's able to take care of herself. She might be timid, she might appear weak, but inside she's very strong and she can take care of herself. So this interaction here was very important to establish that fact about her character. But of course she's not fearless. When the door slams shut, she shudders. The fourth person that she interacts with reassures her, you know, nothing's gonna happen to you, I'm gonna be watching. Here's the thing, he smiles, he seems like a nice guy, but he's probably not in one simple way. We don't know that yet. But by the end of the scene, we do know. He could not help her. He could not protect her from the humiliation that she had to suffer in the next scene. So in that sense, he's a person who reassures her, should be doing his job, but probably didn't. And to me, this was very instructive about this person because why even have a character that she interacts with before her meeting with Hannibal Lecter. What was the need for such a character? What was the need for such dialogue? The importance is that she cannot trust anybody, not even nice guys, but they might fail at helping her do her job, which I won't reveal here, okay, no spoilers in this video. Then she sees more males along the way who obviously have pretty bad intentions. And then of course she meets Miggs, who is sort of ape-like in his cell, and he obviously wants to rape her. So probably the worst of the lot. So at the end of the line is Hannibal Lecter. From the first person to Hannibal Lecter, the males get worse and worse. And the last in the line, the worst of them all, is Hannibal Lecter. Without us knowing, Jonathan Demme has set up the characters in such order that when we actually come across Anthony Hopkins, and she does, okay, because we're watching the film from her point of view, we also assume the worst. So Hannibal Lecter has already been propped up as this some kind of mythical figure. They've been talking about him before we even meet him. And now that we meet him, he's the worst. As far as locations go, you can see she's completely alone, probably very happy. She's probably a loner. She's not very social. She doesn't smile a lot. And even when she does, it's just perfunctory. 
out of grace, nothing else. And work is probably her biggest passion. Second scene, she's in his office, from a wide space to a tight room. In the third scene, she's again in another office. And in the fourth scene, she has to come down the steps into a, some kind of cave, man cave, dungeon, whatever you want to call it. Go deep into the depths of hell to see the worst person possible. So from a location perspective, she's been taken out of her comfort zone where she doesn't want to meet anybody and thrust into the real world in a very tight, dark environment from a very lit and open environment, which has a lot of sky to no light at all from the outside world. The feelings of dread intensify and prepare us, the audience, to meet Hannibal Lecter face to face. And all this happens before he even makes his presence felt because it's done by locations, by acting, and also by costumes and color. This was shot long before color grading. Of course, they used to time films, but you don't have any kind of special color look that is applied to this film. It's shot on Kodak film. So the first uh, scene has warm, golden hour kind of lighting. There's sun co coming through, even though it's a foggy day. It's a deep blue sky. Of course, there's a continuity error because if there's golden hour, it's not very likely that you get a blue deep blue sky at that time. But that's okay, it doesn't matter. But what it says is there is color in this world. Everybody's wearing neutral sort of colors, except all the guys wearing red that surround her in the, uh, the elevator, which I think is an overdone scene, not really required. But of course, it doesn't hurt the film. Brown, blue, beige, and some greens in there. It's all very neutral. There's no color that pops out, draws attention to itself, it's all business-like, not how an office should be. All very mundane, dreary, straightforward. Even her clothes are gray. Her hair is you know, brown. The office has some tones of red in every corner. If you see it's placed there on purpose, there is some red to balance out what she's going to see when she turns to the notice board, and that is to see all the victims of Buffalo Bill. That's when you see a lot of these gory images, which I'm not going to show you, but it's got some red in them. Even the uh, newspaper cutout has red in them. So red is sort of like the standout color in this film. Everything else is neutral and we are led to believe very subtly and very subconsciously that when red comes, you better beware. And of course, all the guys in the elevator are wearing red. Again, another subtle sign of danger because as they go down through the hospital, you can see red pops up a little more, a fire extinguisher, until they come down to the cell where it is red, very obviously red. So they're bathed in red in the scene, literally. Obviously, this is very intentional. It's not required, but it sets a tone for what is about to come, that she is going into a danger zone. Now, the walls are bare without any plaster on them. So it's no more the nice place that she's been to. She goes into a world which lacks color, almost, as you can see. So there is a color story to the first four scenes of The Silence of the Lambs as well. There's also a story being told with costumes, I think. Again, very subtle, not very deep or not in your face. She's wearing a tracksuit at the beginning, right? Then she goes into his superior's office. He's wearing a suit. The next person she meets, a doctor, wears a suit. Even the guy who closed the, uh, the door on her, he's wearing some kind of white suit. Everybody's wearing a suit, so she wears a suit. So she could, you know, maybe belong but her suit is cheap looking, a checkered pattern. Not of the same quality as the other suits, it's pretty obvious, right? She's just put it on and she doesn't care that much about her looks. She does a little bit because she's put lipstick and Hannibal Lecter calls her out on it in the fourth scene. He's special, right? Just from the production design, the art direction, we know that his room is very different. There's a lot more light in his room. There's paintings in his room. There's a table. It looks clean, even though there's a toilet and a bed. The bed is well made. He's wearing a jumpsuit, which has no stains on it. It looks well-pressed. It looks well-tailored. And his hair is perfect. He looks more put together than her. Clearly, we see him for the very first time. We know that he is way above her in terms of intellectual power, in terms of experience in life, and in terms of being able to manipulate her. She really has no chance. But we have to believe that she has chance. And it can only happen if Hannibal Lecter wants it so. There is no reason why he has to respect her based on her looks alone. There has to be something about her that he respects. There's a lot of complexities in that assumption because you have to watch the film to understand how everything unfolds. 
But this very first step that he takes, he wouldn't have taken given his intellectual power. He wouldn't have done this if he didn't believe that she would be a worthwhile person to carry this forward. He gives her a clue at the end of the fourth scene, that's what happened. And if she fails to capitalize on that clue, then everything falls down. So there's no reason for him to even give her a clue if he didn't believe that she would go all the way. She has to prove that in this scene. And this is where all the intense gazing by the males right from the beginning, from the very first scene, shows their worth. And I think it's also a good time to talk about camera work. Jonathan Demi uses a camera technique that he has used before. It's not something unique that he designed for The Silence of the Lambs. It's also a matter of style. You can achieve the same thing with different kinds of camera techniques. It doesn't exactly have to be this shot, but it works. So the choices he made work for this film. And one of the choices he made is all the male characters up to this point looking at Clarice looks straight into the camera lens. Except for the first person, the, the, the second person, the third person, the fourth person, and Hannibal Lecter. They all look straight into the camera, which means they're all looking straight at us. And she never looks straight at the camera, she looks away. So Jonathan Demi is forcing us, the audience, to feel what she feels under the intense scrutiny of male eyes, all sorts of male eyes. And like I said at the beginning, most females on planet Earth go through these things, if not every day, at least every week, every month. It's something that they cannot escape as long as there are males around. And you don't know what intention is behind that gaze. She doesn't know what those intentions are. So most of the interactions that she has with people have tight close-ups going back and forth. When she is more comfortable, when she is more powerful, when we feel that she has more control over the situation, we also see a close-up of her, even though she's not looking straight at camera. When she is not in control and not feeling that powerful, most of the shots also are over-the-shoulder shots. Over-the-shoulder shots, by design, have this characteristic that they place characters antagonistic to each other. It creates a sort of tension between the two characters. The other person's back is in the frame. You're aware of their presence, so it becomes sort of a contest. Anything becomes sort of a contest. But in the fourth scene, we also have different kinds of shots. I'll get into that because the fourth scene is probably the biggest and most important one in this series. The lenses used uh, were Panavision lenses. They used a Panavision camera, film camera. It's a lot of long shots, more towards the medium and long end of the lens and less towards the extreme wide end of the lens. It's compressed frames and compressed frames help to close down the space to make everything appear closer and make everything appear more claustrophobic. There's a lot of camera movement in the beginning. There's a zoom, there's a dolly, there's steady cam, and these are functional shots. They don't really add anything except add movement to the beginning, to the credit sequence as she walks through the FBI training center. So we see a lot of the location. She, uh, we see what she's up against but it gives everything an energy. We know that we're going to be watching something thrilling and energetic right from the get-go because the camera is always moving. But it's not one camera device. It's a lot of devices. There's zooms, there's dollies, there's steady cams. Whatever works to get the shot done. What's most important is the camera is behind her a lot of the time. So we see everything from her point of view. Even when she is in the obstacle course, we see it from her point of view. So we want to experience what she's experiencing as a person. She want, we want to see what she's seeing for the very first time. And then we have reactions of her. So at this shot where she looks at the billboard, we dolly into her face, probably maybe a steady cam as well. We move into her face to see her reaction. And she doesn't flinch away. In fact, it holds her attention. She is interested. And you could say that, you know, it energizes her. She's excited by it. She's thinking about it. And that's what her superior sees. And he's happy because he knows she's probably going to take the bait. And then we get into over-the-shoulder shots and close-ups. So you can see that she is in her close-up looking straight at him. So she's comfortable in this situation. He's somebody that she finds comfort with. Maybe he's a fellow intellectual. And of course, later in the film, they do have scenes again. And they work as a team to solve the crime. So he's somebody she trusts. Close-ups are extremely tight, long telephoto lenses because you don't see a lot of the background is blurred and the focus is on the eyes of the characters. They're framed about dead center, 
and the camera moves a bit to always keep them reframed in the center. It's only when the banter is over and she realizes that this might have something to do with Buffalo Bill and this might not be as important a job as she thought it was, as she hoped it would be. It goes back into over-the-shoulder shots, so she's not very happy. It becomes a sort of confrontation again. She's like, you know what, you told me I have an A- minus, and I'm this and I'm that, but this is what you're giving me? Why don't you give me something better to do? And that's the uh, subtext of why the camera shots change from these tight close-ups involving both of them, and we pull back again and show that you know, there is space between them. He is her boss. She has to listen to him. In the very next scene, the first shot of the doctor is an extreme close-up, and he looks straight at camera while talking to her. And then when we cut back to her, she's in a medium long shot, far away from him, not close to him, very uncomfortable, looking away. She's not trying to hide the fact. And when we cut back to him, you can see he has no clue what she's feeling, or even if he does, he doesn't care. But in the second close-up, the second shot, she does raise her eyes and she does give back to him and she does look at him. So you can see that this shot, the close-up shot, is where she has some sort of control. Because the very next shot is not another close-up of the doctor, but it's a wide shot of the doctor. So the power dynamic is very interesting. You know, he starts with the power in the scene and the scene ends with her having power over him. And then of course they walk again, the camera moves, there's a dolly shot or steady cam. All the telephoto lenses because it makes the hospital seem claustrophobic, not an open space with a lot of people in it, but it seems sort of like a dungeon, you know, sort of tunnel that you're walking through. In a way, it mirrors the energy and uh, the camera movement of the second scene where she walks to her boss's office. When they are in the red zone, again, we move into an over-the-shoulder confrontational shot because obviously she shows him who's boss in the situation, who wins. She has actually used him to get to this point, but the shots are over the shoulder shots, not the close up looking straight at you shot because he has lost his power in the previous scene and he never regains it. We see the entire room from her point of view from a close up, right? And it ends on this person's face who looks right back at her again, the male gaze. It cuts to an over the shoulder shot, not to again her close up. She's not very comfortable. She's not in complete control of this situation. When he opens the gate, the next shot, the next cut is an exact graphic match of the previous frame. I discussed uh, match cuts or in-camera transitions in a previous video. If you haven't watched that, please watch that video. But the shapes are similar, so the cut is seamless. And that's how the fourth scene starts. Every person we see in this scene is from her point of view. So we see her walking down as if it's us walking down the scene. It's us looking down or up at all the inmates in this place. It's pretty standard stuff until the very end when we come to Hannibal Lecter's dungeon which is not like the others. His is made of glass and right away we have an over-the-shoulder confrontation. They're very close together. It's like a long telephoto kind of an over-the-shoulder shot where they're closer together than what you would get with the wide angle. This is again a preference I think from uh, Jonathan Demme to have uh, over the shoulders this way he pr probably preferred medium and telephoto lenses over wide angle lenses. Here he asks her to see her ID which doesn't really mean anything because in the US I figure if somebody asks a police officer or a law enforcement person to show their identification you have to do it. So it's not something out of the ordinary. You know he's gone through lawyers, he's gone through all that crap, he knows his rights but he asks her to step closer so he can look at it. And then he steps forward and for the first time we have this tight close-up. And of course being the amazing actor that Anthony Hopkins is and the way he has portrayed this character, you really feel afraid looking at Anthony Hopkins. There's a lot of stories about that. But his amazing gaze straight at camera is captivating. You feel his intense scrutiny. So of all the males that have looked at her, right from the beginning of this film up to now, his is the most intense. His is the one that captivates her the most, the, the one that interests her the most. You can see that because right after that point, the cut to her look back is again a close-up where she looks at it without blinking. Anthony Hopkins blinks very rarely in this film and only by design. That's another great uh, tactic he used as an actor. But I really love the reverse angle shot of her in a tight close-up which means that she is not shy, she doesn't feel afraid, she doesn't feel out of control, 
She doesn't feel out of power. She feels equal. She feels excited. She feels like this is not a waste of her time. This guy is special. You could imagine them meeting at a bar, making eye contact and being drawn to each other intellectually because they match. I hope that makes some sort of sense. But of course, as the scene progresses, the shot changes into an over-the-shoulder shot where his power is higher because she needs something from him. She cannot get it by force. And we've already seen that she has to find other ways to getting things done, especially with a doctor. That might not work with this guy. She's not sure how he is interested in her. And of course, he's in a cell. She has to find a way to impress him somehow. She loses her power when she tries to justify her presence here. He doesn't have to justify anything, right? He's already there. But he understands that she needs something from him, needs something from him. And that's why he says, That is rather slippery of you, Agent Starling. And that's where she loses her power because he now knows that he is in control. And she realizes subconsciously, probably even consciously, that she lost a little bit of power there because she's a trainee. And not only that, she let out that she needs something from him indirectly. The next thing he asks her to do is to sit down, which he does. This is an often used compliance tactic. When you get people to say yes to small things, a lot of small things, then you can ask them to say yes to bigger things. It's something that has been shown. You could read a book by Robert Cialdini about influence. Uh, he goes into detail on how this works, and it's probably what he is using here, Hannibal Lecter. The third thing he asks her to do, again, seemingly innocuous, right? Just show me your badge, come closer, okay, sit down. And then he asks her about Migs. So she has no reason to not comply. We continue the scene where he is in a close-up looking straight at her. And she's obviously uncomfortable, of course. It gets worse because he displays his power. He reveals certain facts about her perfume and what she's wearing. And she realizes he is no ordinary person. She tries to change the subject by talking about his drawings. So he cut to a wide shot. Okay, so she wants a moment, a timeout, some breathing space. And of course, it's another way to give more detail to Hannibal Lecter's character that he's been to Florence. Not only has he been to Florence, but he can draw what he saw from memory and draw very well. So again, another step up. It just escalates to a point where she is getting really impressed by this person. He is on another level. Being a rookie, she makes the mistake of getting right to it because, you know, there's nothing else that she can do. It's, he's completely out of her league. So she asks her to, you know, get the survey done. And of course, it doesn't work. He calls her out on it and she replies, you know, either you will or you won't. If you won't, I'll just get up and go. A segue into Buffalo Bill here, which is completely out of the blue. It's Deus Ex Machina here because there is no reason for Hannibal Lecter to mention Buffalo Bill at this point to a recruit, even though he might have an idea that that might be why she's here. But by the end of this interaction, when, he, uh, when she talks about getting into the details of that case, you can see it comes back to a close-up of her at the center. She's in control. This is something that you know, she can talk about. Other stuff, she's not very good at. But her work, yes. So indirectly, just through camera work, we feel when he says, You send that through now. He finds some amount of respect for her because she has done her homework. If he had to show her who he was, this is how she showed him that she is somebody worth pursuing. So he said, okay, let me spend a few more minutes with this person. Give me the survey. Let me think about it. He calls her out on the survey. And of course, he piles it on. He also insults her on her appearance, on the fact that she might be just a step away from white trash, from poor background or a lower middle class background. The interesting thing here is by the end of these insults, Okay, which is accompanied by music, camera pulls in closer to Hannibal Lecter and to Jodie Foster. She ends up in a close-up. She's not in the center of the frame. Now, I don't think that this is on purpose, okay? Just because the frame is so odd and there are no other frames of similar nature, it's possible that they were supposed to get her in the center of the frame, she moved off. And they couldn't turn the camera quickly because it would just draw attention to itself or maybe somebody forgot, I don't know. They both get into the center of the frame, roughly. It becomes a close-up where he's looking at her. And she gets a close-up of her own, whether she's in the center or not, doesn't matter at this point, because it doesn't affect her that much. She's probably been through this, and she fights back. 
But are you strong enough to point that high-powered perception at yourself? And of course, that doesn't work on him either. So he throws a survey right back at her. He's not, he's not going to have any of it. But here's the thing. Instead of turning away, he ups the ante again and tells her about somebody he ate. He's a cannibal, right? Hannibal cannibal. But instead of flinching, looking away, she looks right back at him. And he senses that. They have this connection that when he talks about the case, when he talks about anything intellectual that excites him, she gets excited and he sees that. So he realizes that she's somebody that he has some kind of connection with that he can talk to. And being an intellectual person is very, diff uh, very difficult to find anybody to talk to. So he is impressed, for sure. But he needs some time to think about it. Because he knows he has nowhere to go, nothing pressing to do. And if she is worthy, she will be back. She will do something to get his attention. It didn't work, of course. She failed to get him to do anything. But she succeeded in showing him that she's interested. She's somebody that he can intellectually bond with. There's no other reason for him to care about her. He doesn't feel pity for her for sure, even though it might seem that he has some amount of pity for her. He's really manipulating her. Then the camera goes back into a long shot when he's done. It signals that this interaction is over. She stands up to walk away. So as she walks back, we have the Migs incident where he throws some sperm at her. And this is what gets Hannibal Lecter to act. Not that she was the victim here, not that something bad happened to poor Clarice and he had to step in as a male, not as a father figure or as a lover. It's out of decorum. It was bad form of Miggs to do something like this. His room is perfect. He's well-mannered. He says, please sit down. Please show me your badge. He doesn't use abusive words. He shows her. He desperately wants her to know that he doesn't belong with these people here. He's different class. She's his guest. And you don't tolerate that. He is compelled to help her. He wasn't sure. He has to manipulate her, of course. We know this because if you watch the rest of the film, you'll understand. He wants to use her, but he wasn't sure about her. But Miggs compelled him to give her a chance. And that's why he does it. And when he does it, it's not in a close-up, face-to-face, no male gaze. It's just sheer desperation on his part because he wants to do the right thing. He wants to say the please, the thank yous, to be the proper gentleman. So he gives her a clue being a good sport, just to even the odds. But this is why. The 10 soundtrack by composer Howard Shore creates a chilling atmosphere, amplifying the tension throughout these scenes. In the first scene, you have a very different kind of music playing, which contrasts with the visuals that you're looking at. But by the end, it all comes together. The editing gets faster and faster as we get to the end, the climactic point of uh, the fourth scene. And you could say this is the first big, uh, the inciting incident of the story, something that starts the story. There's a lot of reaction shots of Clarice in the editing because obviously Jonathan Demi wanted the audience to identify with her. She's the protagonist of this story completely. Hannibal Lecter has very few scenes. So it was so critical to have an actor of the caliber of Jodie Foster to play this part. The other things in terms of cinematography is the aspect ratio. It was shot on a standard 1.85 to 1, which is DCP flat. It has more vertical space than uh, the 2.39 or scope ratio, which gives us more of a face to see in the close-ups. So if you imagine you crop it for a scope, you lose a lot of the face. And the close-ups were very important for the feeling of this film. The use of close-ups being a powerful symbol in, in filmmaking is not new or unique here because uh, you have this famous saying by Alfred Hitchcock, the most important thing should be the biggest in the frame. It's been used a lot ever since uh, cinema started. So having two powerful actors fill the frame, when they're doing such a great job, you don't need anything else. You just don't need any background or any added gimmicks. You don't need to move the camera unnecessarily. You don't need any fast editing. Just having great actors perform is thrilling enough. A lot of this film is about male authority and power over Clary Starling, and women in general maybe. And it was seen that Hannibal Lecter is the only person that appears to have some sort of decorum that seems to give her the respect that she deserves. And everybody else makes light of it or 
abuses her or tries to manipulate her or whatever. But he, yes, he does try to manipulate her, but within reason, by playing a game where if she loses, she loses. But it's a fair game. So he's really giving her the respect by saying, you know, you're, you're worthy to be playing against. And the key takeaway is the point of view of the story is of a female character. The primary audience for horror films are males. It's a male audience. So trying to get a male audience to identify with a female character, that's why Jonathan Demme won an Oscar, for being able to get some of the feelings that a woman goes through every day and translate that through the medium of cinema. So everybody watching it feels what she's going through. And that's an amazing achievement as a director. I hope you found this video useful and enlightening. If you like more videos like this one, please let me know in the comments below. Please let me know how I can improve them. I've been making all sorts of videos over the last 10 years on this YouTube channel. I really like to go in depth into certain movies and scenes and cover cinematography and other filmmaking aspects because sometimes we don't realize the amount of effort and the amount of detail that go into putting something together and making something work. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.